Hello, welcome to Required Viewing Trends and Current Events. This is a public affairs show shot here at IPFW. It's brought to you by the Departments of History, Political Science, as well as the American Democracy Project. My name is Andrew Downs. I'm a member of the Political Science Department, and my co-host is Ann Livshiz, also from the Department of History. In honor of Veterans Day, celebrated on November 11th, this month Required Viewing is devoted to discussing the subject of veterans in higher education and contemporary American society. Now, fun fact, uh, we started commemorating um, uh, uh, November 11th um, as, as a way to commemorate World War I veterans, and it was only expanded to include veterans from other wars and renamed Veterans Day uh, by Congress in 1954. Now, of course, veterans have been around as long as wars have been around, but there have been some very interesting and important changes, especially in the 20th century. And so if we're going to want to talk about veterans in higher education, we have to start with the 1944 GI Bill, or the Servicemen's Readjustment um, Act. Um, it provided a college or educational vocational um, uh, college or education um, or vocational education for returning World War II veterans and in addition to the educational benefits it also provided um, other types of loans for veterans to help them buy homes and start their own businesses and the, the GI Bill's impact was huge um, initially there was an assumption that about 640,000 out of 60 million veterans will want this benefit um, actually by 1947 about half of all college students were on the GI Bill and by 1950 about 6.6 .6 million veterans were actually enrolled in, um, um, in the colleges. And this was a very important contributing factor for the growth and the development of, higher, um, of American higher, um, um, higher education. Um, and there were some changes made in the subsequent, in the subsequent decades. Um, some of the benefits were cut back because the, the post-World War II GI Bill was deemed, uh, was deemed too generous. And also adjustments needed to be made because the, 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 we, we went from um, uh, the GI Bill as, as benefits for veterans who served in time of war to the possibility that it could include veterans um, who did not actually serve in um, in wars, and this brings us to, of course, our contemporary situation and, and the recent um, really interesting changes uh, that kind of the so-called post-9/11 GI Bill that, in many ways, returns to the post-World War II model. Um, the, the 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 government is making direct payments to the universities to um, to cover the full cost of undergraduate education. Um, there are some additional benefits, but again, we don't see the loan, you know, the loans and the businesses and so on the way we saw after World War II, um, their medical benefits, but the, but the focus really is on educational benefits. Mm -hmm. And we should quickly mention, not that we want to discount those other benefits, for example, the housing boom post-World War II was driven in large part by the benefit that GIs received when they came back. So there were really phenomenal impacts elsewhere in society. We're just, since we're at a university, we're going to focus on the educational benefits, because why wouldn't we? And we do have, fortunately, the, uh, uh, the Pew Center for uh, uh, Social Research recently published some new studies uh, some new findings. If you want to look for these, you can go to PewSocialTrends.org. That's PewSocialTrends.org. Uh, here are a couple of the findings that they had. They'll be coming up on the screen for you. For example, among veterans who served post 9-11, so this is, these are different, these are folks who uh, were enlisted and, and uh, part of the military post September 11, 2001, 96% of them, of course, are proud of their service, as they should be, and, and quite frankly, the population as a whole has a similar sort of feeling toward them. 74% say that their military experience actually helped them get ahead in life, which uh, is one of the things that, of course, they, they tell people, you become a member of the military and this will help you out. And then 82% of them actually say they would advise a, advise a young person who is close to them to join the military. And so for a lot of people, when they're thinking about whether or not someone should join the military, they may be thinking of it in terms of what's okay for someone else's kids, but the folks who actually were serving uh, in the military post 9-11, 82% of them are actually saying, it's okay, I would actually advise a close friend of mine or a close relative of mine to go ahead and join, which I think is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting commentary on military. Um, and it's certainly, I mean, the other interesting thing about it, of course, is that it does seem, uh, it, it clusters, it, it sort of it clusters veterans and it clusters military service because it means that people who are in the military are more likely to know other people who are in the military, whereas the people who are not in the military are far less likely to think of that as, as an option um, and encourage their, their kids to do so. So there's a little bit of a, ga a kind of potential gap between the people who have experience in this matter and people who don't. It almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy even mm -hmm. that, that, you know, you are a member of the military, so your children will become a member of the military. You're not a member of the military, so your children were not. And we do see a divide here. We'll talk a little bit more about divides later on. But for example, only about half the people uh, in the general population would actually recommend to a close uh, relative of theirs or a close friend of theirs to actually join the military. So there is a bit of a gap that we see. We do have some other data that's coming up. This is also from that Pew study, and down at the bottom of the screen you can see uh, where you can find this data. But of the veterans who served in the post-9-11 era, 
of their military service, 93% of them say that it helped them mature, 90% of them say it taught them how to work with others, and 90% say that it helped build some self-confidence. And I know we here on campus, we have students who are, who are uh, either serving right now or did serve, and several of these things certainly are true. You and I both know of some students very specifically who went to the military because they were immature, and they came out much, much more mature individuals. And certainly those who have served in the military uh, do carry themselves with a lot more confidence in the classroom, don't they? For the most part. I mean, not, not always, but, the, but, but a lot of times, yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Some more data coming up on the screen right now. 44% uh, of the post-9-11 veterans say their readjustment to civilian life was difficult, and 25% of the veterans from earlier eras say their readjustment to civilian life was more difficult. This is interesting because we've almost doubled in terms of those who've had a difficult time readjusting to civilian life. And that actually can be a bit of a problem, I think. And I think that, I mean, it, it, it's a very, very interesting statistic because I think one of the things that perhaps it's, it's related to is the changes in the nature of warfare um, and the nature of, our, the nature of our military, that a, a significantly smaller percentage of the general population of the United States serves in the military. And as a result, when they come back, they, they're less likely to, the more, more people that they meet are going to be, um, uh, have less experience um, with the military as opposed to previous wars like World War II. Um, and these other kind of larger, larger scale conflicts. Um, and then the, the other important thing that comes out of the statistic is also that if this is how, if this is how the veterans of, of contemporary wars feel about this, then this is something that really needs to be, um, more attention needs to be paid to this um, because, um, because clear, uh, a lot of the programs were designed based on the earlier models, based on veterans of earlier conflicts. And so uh, readjustments need to, be make, uh, need to be made to deal with the specific challenges facing this generation of veterans. Uh, with a very, very different experiences, both yeah. of the wars itself and then the life back. Yeah, certainly what, what the soldiers in World War II were asked to do is very different than what the soldiers over in Iraq and Afghanistan are being asked to do today. And there's another, there's another bit of data that's a, a bit troubling for people who see it. It'll be coming up on the screen right about now. This is data uh, from the veterans, once again, of veterans who served post, uh, in the post-9-11 era. 48% say they have experienced strains in family relations since leaving the military. 47% say they've had frequent outbursts of anger, and 32% say they ha there have been times when they felt that they didn't care about anything, absolutely cared about nothing. And, and, and this is troubling, not only for the families in terms of them being able to uh, sort of get back to a normal life. You know, you, you come back from being overseas, and suddenly what you're going to do is, is go to work uh, in, in a place uh, but you don't know how to work there. You're not used to working there. It's a different situation than what you were in. Your family is who most of us turn to uh, for, for that moment of venting and those sorts of things. And this data is suggesting that the folks who are coming back are having a very difficult time adjusting. And of course, these categories, you know, strains on family relations, outbursts of anger, um, you know, 32 percent, that sounds kind of really close to, de close to depression. These are, these are also, um, this is experienced not just by members of the military um, and, and veterans, but, uh, but or ordinary, ordinary people as well. And I think that um, as a result, because these are, com these are relatively common um, uh, sentiments, it makes it sometimes that much more difficult to, um, to isolate the specific the causes, um, the very different causes, um, why veterans may feel this way, and as a result, perhaps less assistance and, um, um, and, and the services in order to help them deal with these particular um, problems. Mm -hmm. And of course, post-secondary institutions have to be thinking about how to deal with not only active duty soldiers, since we have so many folks who are in the guard who maybe are called up, but also those who are returning, whether they're 18 years old or 30 years old or 50 years old, we really have to be thinking about that. And so uh, here at IPFW, there actually is something known as the Military Student Service, excuse me, Office of Military Student Services, the Office of Military Student Services. Uh, they do wonderful work. It's headed up by a person named uh, Joe Vaughn, Joyce Joe Vaughn. She goes by Joe. And we're actually going to hear from her right now. She's going to describe for us what exactly it is that the Office of Military Student Services does. The basic mission is to provide support services for military personnel who are transitioning uh, to academics from the military structure and also support those who are currently serving and also attending school. Joe also explained to us what it is she does as the military student services coordinator. Let's hear from her again. We offer different kinds of programming. We offer films, we offer camaraderie get-togethers, call-outs. We provide support for um, academic credit transfers. We provide support as far as um, 
folks coming into the office who have issues with professors or instructors where things aren't going well due to political biases or any other kind of issue that's happening. Okay. We also provide support for those who are deploying in the middle of a semester. And we should mention that Joe Vaughn was actually instrumental in making in, in ensuring that the grant that is funding um, the, the the services that she's providing um, that she was instrumental in bringing that grant here to um, to IPFW. Of course, this is a limited term grant, and so one of the big questions for IPFW is going to be what happens when the grant expires and whether or not Joe is going to be able to continue provide these services, these very much needed services to um, uh, to IPFW students. And even with the grant, I mean, there still is a, a certain limitations to what her office can do um, because because of, for example, straight space restrictions. The fact that the office is in the basement of Neff um, that makes it very kind of difficult for, uh, for, uh, for handicapped people to access, for example, a very small windowless room um, that, again, can cause some problems in her ability to reach out to the students who may perhaps need her services the most. Yeah, and you actually have to know where it is. This is not something that you're going to stumble on accidentally. This is something you have to go looking for. It is in the basement of Neff, Neff Hall, and so we encourage people to head down to room B50 in the suite of offices in there to see, see things down there. Uh, and, and she really deserves a lot of credit for helping uh, to create the office. They're serving uh, 438 students at IPFW right now, 300 over at Ivy Tech, so this is not an insignificant number of students being served. Absolutely, um, and of course the, the the mention of the benefits and especially the educational benefits to that are provided as part of the post 9/11 GI Bill um, has caused has caused some problems. These are not necessarily problems specific to to IPFW because of course we um, we are a fully accredited institution of higher learning. Um, but veterans in, in recent years, veterans have been um, subject to predatory behavior from for-profit colleges because of the little known well outside of those colleges perhaps 90/10 uh, rule. Basically, for for-profit institutions, in order for them to um, to, uh, to be able to get, 10% um, uh, uh, of their money has to come from non-federal sources in order for them to be able to get the other 90% from federal sources, such as loans. Um, and the GI Bill benefits don't actually count as federal money. And so this makes the veterans particularly attractive, um, a particularly attractive group uh, because, because their money can help satisfy that 10% requirement for these colleges. And uh, a lot of these for-profit institutions, they're being investigated for other things as well. They're being investigated for not having um, enough accreditation, for high dropout rates, uh, for inability of students to complete uh, these programs, for the kind of misleading information about the possibility of being able to transfer credits uh, from those particular, um, for, uh, you know, from th those particular institutions. Um, and just to give you um, kind of the, the, the scale of this, eight for-profit colleges last year got $1.02 billion of veterans' benefits, which is 23% of all of the benefits that are being received by veterans in the country today. And, there, and, there, and there's, there's some work being done in Congress um, by, by Democrats in Congress to try to change and adjust the 90-10 rule in order to make sure that, that veterans are not being um, uh, targeted and, um, and, and abused in this way. Yeah, I mean, it is a wonderful benefit that would provide a good education to people. But if you don't know exactly what you're doing when you go off to college, you may fall victim to some, some uh, less than savory practices. That's not to say that all for-profit colleges are a problem. But really, folks who are looking for a school should be looking at for, for schools that are accredited, uh, that have the ability to transfer credits from one institution to another. And of course, what, stu what students really should be thinking about doing is looking for people like Joe and going to talk to her because she helps people navigate their way through all the bureaucratic red tape. Absolutely. Um, and uh, when you know, we want to make sure that, we, that we're careful because we don't want to present all veterans as simply sort of this, this group of people who, um, who are not able to, um, to fend for themselves. And, and certainly one of the interesting things that we see, um, especially in recent years, is increase in, stu in, in student veterans' activism. And I think part of it, again, again as a historian, I have to keep bringing up historical, um, you know, historical changes, um, that, that part of this is really a result of the changes in the nature of warfare and the way that we, um, we as a society deal with wars and also deal with veterans. So for example, after World War II, veterans were seen as, you know, as heroes. Um, after the Vietnam War, veterans um, were, were seen as, in a much more problematic light. In a way, veteran, contemporary veterans are sort of a mixture of the two. Um, they're coming back um, from a war that many people in American society have some a lot of concerns and, and, and questions about. But at the same time, they, the, the concerns about the war are not transferred on the veterans themselves. And perhaps that's something that and combined with the statistics we discussed earlier about feeling that there are these kind of differences, perception, and understanding, that this is something that's, that's mobilizing veterans, uh, student veterans, to try to, um, to organize um, in order to make sure that their, their needs are being met. Yeah, and we do have a group here on the IPFW campus. They're known as the MWR Alliance, which for military folks, MWR has one meeting. For the rest of us, it may have a different meeting. It's a play on that acronym, and it actually has helped people recognize 
that what the student organization is supposed to be about. The uh, student representative of that organization is Tiffany Kravick uh, Kelly, and she is here to tell us a little bit about uh, that particular organization. Well, the whole purpose of MWR was to get soldiers that are on campus, veterans that are on campus, together to network with each other, um, to be a network to provide suppo support. Um, you know, so you have a study buddy that understands some things that you've gone through, speaks the same language. Um, the military is a culture unto itself, so we are trying to give us a, a, an outlet. Um, hopefully at some point we'll actually have a, a lounge type community area that we can have everybody to come and you know study together and um, basically just support each other. And creation of these kinds of organizations is not surprising given some of the findings from the Pew study, for example, um, that talks about the, di the, the differing views um, that veterans and non-veterans have about, about themselves and, and their experiences. Yeah, there are some pieces of data that are coming up on the screen now. 83% of the adults of adults say that military personnel and their families have had to make a lot of sacrifices since 9-11. And I think that makes sense. I think people would agree with that. But believe it or not, 43% of adults say that American people have had to make a lot of sacrifices. So there's already this kind of large gap that exists between what you and I have had to experience as non-military personnel and those families that, that are military, uh, almost on a two-to-one sort of basis. Right. And of course, the 43 number, I mean, percent sounds awfully high. Um, I mean, but you know, th these are this is a public opinion poll, so I'm sure people were thinking in terms of price of gas and and burdens maybe at work because someone who works with you has been deployed, and so that has shifted work around there. So I, you know, I, it might be a little high, but I think uh, I, I don't think that it's outrageously high. The next slide might be a little more disconcerting. Of those who actually acknowledge that there is a gap in burden that's shared by by military families and non-military families. 26% say that the gap is unfair. In other words, most of us think that this is, this is an acceptable arrangement. 70% consider the gap to be, quote, just part of being in the military, which is an interesting uh, way to look at it. There's some sense there. You've agreed to join the military, but at the same time, you're being asked to make a really large sacrifice uh, for the rest of us. And again, I mean, as a historian, one of the things, and this is perhaps why the 43% was, was so troubling, I mean, again, if we think about the changes in the nature of warfare, um, that, you know, m for, for most of the 20th century, sort of modern wars meant that, 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 the bur that while, yes, the military, the members of the military are going to be sort of more at, you know, more at risk, um, there was the expectation that sort of the home front was very important um, and sacrifices are being made, whereas in, in the more recent conflicts, I think, other than the presence of yellow ribbons, um, it's relatively easy to ignore the, poss the, the possibility that there is actually a war going on or multiple wars um, going on. Sure, and I think there's something else that we should be thinking about, and that's that for some people, when they, when they think about the military, for a lot of families, it was the way out. It was the way up. You know, you join the military because of the benefits, because you can get your education paid for, because you might be able to afford a house better, because it does prepare you for work, and so it was the way up. And so there's some question of who's actually bearing this burden, and is it unfair for it to be based like that? Uh, we already talked earlier about who's willing to recommend to family members that they become members of the military. I think that's a bit of an issue, and it's not surprising that there's that that, that there there are problems of, of adjustment and of adjustment and readjustment, um, precisely because the, the greater differences in, in experiences from previous conflicts. Yeah, MWR Alliance also engages in some other activities. They'll do things like picnics and some speaker series, but they also have some larger projects that they're working on. We have a brief clip from Tiffany to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, we work closely with Joe Vaughn uh, in military student services, so our missions kind of run side by side. Um, we've done picnics for military personnel and veterans and their families. Um, we've had some movies that we've done, um, one the Lioness, uh, which was about female veterans uh, in combat. So. And then there's been a couple of, you know, just kind of get together and talk, discuss about things that are issues on campus, how can we fix them, how, what, what do we need to do? Um, and that's one of the really big parts of it, too, is we're trying to take active part in our learning experience. The returning veterans and active duty military personnel have affected what happens in the classroom. Um, and this, th th this raises a number of really interesting questions about the impact that the veterans are having on the, um, on the American edu um, higher educational system uh, right now. Now, of course, it's very difficult to generalize because we're dealing with a very, di um, a very diverse 
um, a, a body of, of veterans who have different levels of academic background um, and, um, and level of motivation, um, but it raises some questions for, for faculty. Are we as faculty prepared to deal with students, many of whom have special needs, in, in large part because, again, as a historian, the changes in um, the changes nature of warfare and, and, medical, and medical science means that many more veterans um, who are coming back are coming back with, um, with disabilities um, that, that some of us um, as, as faculty are simply not, they're not, they're not physically, they're not obvious and some of us are simply not prepared to deal with, with them. Um, the, other, the other question uh, that, that, that comes up is the question of how certain subjects um, are, being, are being taught in American universities, um, and, uh, especially, um, especially subjects that deal with uh, military history and, and, and warfare um, and, and the potential, uh, the possibility of conflict um, the sense of you know um, the difference of you know having been there uh, versus the more academic um, uh, the, the more academic backgrounds of the people teaching these particular um, these particular subjects. I've heard from um, I, I often hear from from students, uh, from veterans, or even members of the ROTC that they sometimes feel marginalized in the classroom because they feel that the other students are treating them differently um, or that their viewpoints are not necessarily being adequately required. Uh, uh, um, you know, sort of. Um, listen to, um, and I think sort of for, for the big challenge for for, for us and, and for for institutions of higher learning is you know how do we deal with this? Is this a, a kind of a, a mental health issue, or is it more of a pedagogical curricular issue um, that needs to that needs to be addressed? One of the things I find interesting about this is that at IPFW, a lot of the faculty members really like having people with experience in the classroom because it makes the classroom discussions much more dynamic. We can take these broad theoretical concepts and actually show some practical application. But it does come with some challenges, and, and you're just covering a few of them. And we'll be right back. Accelerate your career with a master's degree from IPFW, Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne, your graduate university. As is our custom, we have a list of suggested readings, and we're dealing with something like, uh, like veterans. Um, th there are a lot of readings that we could have suggested, and so um, um, the first couple uh, focus on works of, uh, works of literature with my own personal biases uh, thrown in there. Uh, the first one on the list is Eric Marie Remarque, um, a, a German post-World War I writer, uh, The Road Back, The Black Obelisk, The Three Comrades. These are books exploring sort of the post-war um, post life for veterans in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. The second name on the list, Heinrich Böll, um, is also German, but this time post-World War II. Uh, Billiards at Half Past Nine, and the clown. Um, these are books that are exploring the the life of uh, World War II German veterans as they make a readjustment to German life. And then to make sure we don't exclude America entirely, um, Tim O'Brien, the things they carried, um, a collection of short stories dealing with the American Vietnam War um, experience. The next book on the list, Eric Greitens, The Heart and the Fist, The Education of a Humanitarian, The Making of a Navy Seal, a recent book um, about, uh, about the experiences of, of a Navy Seal in his trans uh, during the war, um, is really kind of an amazing book that's receiving rave reviews. Um, the, the next book on the list, Carl Merlanti's What It's Like to Go to War, he's, um, he's a Vietnam War veteran um, who's writing this book both for veterans um, uh, and their experiences, but also with an eye towards policymakers about what they have to think about and take into account as they're making important decisions that are going to affect um, millions of lives. And then a scholarly book, Edward Tick's War in the Soul, Healing Our Nation's Veterans from Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, uh, for those interested in that particular aspect of the veterans' experience, um, a very useful starting point. On required viewing, we also like to bring the spotlight and put it on one of our faculty members. This month, we'll be looking at David Parnell. He's actually a visiting instructor in the Department of History, and David's going to tell us a little bit about the research he does. I study the Byzantine Empire uh, in the 6th century under the reign of the Emperor Justinian. And what I'm really interested in is officers uh, in the Byzantine army and how they interacted with themselves, what their relationships were, and how they identified with each other. What I like to look at uh, are the officers individually uh, and their relationships they formed, and also the officers collectively and how they all functioned together as a group. And I can look at their collective nature through a database, which I can use to produce statistics to tell me all about what these officers were like. Byzantine officers uh, were divided in a couple of ways. They were divided primarily through their ethnic and cultural identities, uh, which were separate. 
Uh, the Byzantine officers, for the most part, were natives of the Byzantine Empire. But there were many officers who were considered foreigners. They were from outside the empire. And many Byzantines would have called them barbarians. The Byzantines generally were accepting of these barbarians in their army. But there was a little concern in Byzantine society that these barbarians uh, were just a little bit uh, unreliable in the way that they interacted with others. I have discovered in my research, though, that this concern was a generally unfounded concern, and that for the most part, uh, barbarian officers were just as suitable as native officers. In fact, in some situations, these barbarian officers were even braver than natives in the way they fought. Studying the way that barbarians and natives interacted in the Byzantine army and the relationships they had is both interesting and also very helpful for determining how the society in which the army was created worked. As is our custom, we like to end the show by looking at some important um, uh, news developments that, that we would like people to, uh, to, to think about and pay attention to. And of course, this week, we can't not mention the death of Gaddafi um, and the implications this is going to have for the development, uh, for the political developments in Libya. Um, we're hoping, obviously, we're hoping for a democratic outcome, but certainly, again, as a historian, um, we do have to wonder um, the, the political direction that that country is going to take now that they're finally rid of their dictator that they've had in place since 1969. Yeah, well, 40 years worth of dictatorship, nothing important there. So the one that I want to bring up is something I actually brought up before. This will be viewed most often during November of 2011, and the Budget Super Committee is going to have to be coming out with this recommendation soon. So that's something very important for us to keep our eyes on. Um, and if we're going to if we're going to talk about America, uh, we, we probably should also mention the sort of the Occupy Blank movement that's uh, that's sweeping the country, um, and uh, some in, in particularly interesting recent developments. Um, it has gone from pr pr uh, primarily peaceful demonstrations um, to a certain amount of violence, especially um, especially in Oakland. And so I think this is definitely, and especially as we're moving closer to the election, it'll be very interesting to see the impact that this this populist movement is going to have on on, on politics. Mm -hmm. And Anne, I know you have one more on your list. What's I that one? I do have one more as a historian. I would like to mention this one, the, the, the opening of more of, of Saddam Hussein's archives. Now, we've had them, the American ha government has had them in their possession for a number of years now, but more of these documents are being, are, are be, are being opened up and available to researchers. Um, and so it's very interesting for those studying, again, speaking of dictatorships and wars, um, but, uh, kind of a, 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 a great opportunity for historians um, to, um, uh, to work with. Sure, sure. Well, I want to thank you all for watching. This has been Required Viewing Trends and Current Events here at IPFW. It's brought to you by the Departments of History and Political Science, as well as the American Democracy Project. I also want to make sure that we thank CATV for recording it and making it available, and then the library here at IPFW, the Helmkey Library, for posting it on MDON. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you have a good week.